any questions as we go. And I want to thank you for the comments that uh, people put in our group yesterday and sent me emails and messages uh, because they are really supportive to me and help me know that I'm on the right track to know that uh, you love the material so much. So that's, that's really good. I don't really want to make long videos with tons of things because actually if you can get one or two messages clearly, that's really what will make the difference. But you can see that my teaching style is to ask you questions because I really think that the diamonds here are, are going to come from you. I'll give you some information, but you've got to put it in the context of what you're trying to create and where are you coming from with the paintings? Because when you hook into that, then you, 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 you feel more confident. You know what you're trying to achieve. So uh, you can also look at my, my video on uh, the art of art where I'm talking about strategy, applying strategy to your own take on art. So have a look at those things if, if that's where you're at. There are resources available for any of you to share and, um, and let us know what you think of. So yesterday in composition, uh, we looked at exactly that, your message and where you're coming from and how that will impact the actual painting and I left that one up uh, for the moment for, uh, uh, to make some points about the values in that uh, painting. So we could use, um, uh, here's a painting with light girl, directly on this wild rose. This is an Australian wild rose. So the light is hitting it directly and we're not cr creating a lot of contrast through the light the composition is simply this flower because it's such an interesting flower. It makes a great composition, right? It's a really different looking flower and it has that little fan of gorgeous gray leaves. And so we talked yesterday, I showed you this one, which is a really <laughs> simple flower, a five petal, tea tree flower, but we've made it much more interesting painting by increasing the contrast through the light. So I mentioned yesterday that we would come back to this because we're going to talk about how light affects the painting. Yes, with the composition and the contrast and making it more interesting because of even look at the center of the flower that actually has this sort of honey sitting in that little reserve in the center of the flower that's green part of it's in shadow so it's really dark and part of it is lime green so uh light is having a very big impact and we'll discuss more about how to do that now so you see that one Light, we're going to really cover off um, three key areas, light and contrast that I'm referring to there about creating that contrast. Um, uh, using the grayscale effectively, I'm talking about creating um, mono paintings and I'll explain what that means and, and also the direction of light and how that helps. Remember in composition, I said we are taking a two-dimensional surface and making something three-dimensional within it. And so there are uh, tools and ways that we can create that. We do that through, I said to you, the sharpness of an edge, the um, intensity of a color or not further back, and also the light. So let's have a look really at our uh, discussing what light means in our paintings. Oops. <laughs> so um, I need to just clarify with you terms here when I'm talking about light. So in Australia, we tend to talk about tones of light and uh, in the rest of the world, they seem to talk about value. 
value and the depth of dark or light value. So that's the space that we're actually in. Um, and I want to refer to my gray scale. Now you saw my quote in the, um, in the video that color gets all the credit, but light does all the work. And I want to explain more about where that is coming from and what it means. Because when we paint something and we're unsure about what's going on, if you've ever had that feeling, then the problem solving that we need to do often comes back to whether the darkest darks were dark enough and whether the lightest lights were light enough. That is so often the underlying problem. And we might be looking at colour, we might be looking at the line of what's happening, but often it's the dark and the light because obviously we don't see anything at all in the world unless we see, unless there's light, right? Hello, Heather. <laughs> and light is, uh, gives us everything. And you saw in the video, if you've seen that, where I just had some spheres and if we put a white one on black, as if we make it um, from gray to lighter, 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 when it was white against black, it actually looks bigger. So the light can have a very big impact on how we see something and whether we choose to put something on a light background or a dark background. Uh, here's an example. A framer asked me to do this series. Whoa, I have trouble with this reverse thing. <laughs> Oh, this is a Banksia on a white background, right? Now, there was a specific reason he wants a white background, but you can see how it pops forward when it's on the white background. I could have also chosen to make a black background or a dark background to make the focus that I want actually pop forward. But we'll discuss about how we use those differences. So, years ago, I don't know what this little course was, you know, that I went to on an evening or something, a long, long time ago. And, um, and I arrived there, it was about painting with acrylics. And here we are in this lesson, just painting the little black and white boxes. Okay. So, if you've seen my so just down one side, that side, <laughs> oh, the reverse thing. If you've seen my uh, lessons on create the colours you see, where we actually create, um, you get a small number of paints and actually create uh, colour charts in your own book so that you can refer to the colour charts. But I start the charts with a black and white gray scale. This is a gray scale. Okay. And this gray scale is so important. So at this course that I've gone to, we just sit there and I paint, you just had to paint the little black and white boxes. <laughs> and I went home going, yep. <laughs> Sorry, I just paid for a lesson where I sat and did little black and white boxes. I had absolutely no idea what it was about. So I hope you don't feel that way. What I want to show you is how actually that gray scale, it is the strongest tool you can have and knowledge you can have when you're trying to create paintings. Even if you uh, paint abstract paintings, I noticed someone this morning, forgive me for not remembering who, said they were usually an abstract painter now, those things I was talking about in composition yesterday, about contrast, about having a big shape, a small shape, uh, differences on your canvas, they're going to be the same in abstract as they are in realist painting. So here, uh, the same sort of thing, when we're talking about light and whether we're going from the darkest area, and you saw in the video that I've got the painting of a waratah, um, a, 
really macroed in on the florets of the Waratah flower. And in between the flowers where there's deep shadow, it's very dark, going right up to where the highlight is, really light. So where the light hits it, and this is what informs and creates the form within our painting. So what happens in many cases is it's the dark wasn't dark enough. So the light doesn't pop out. So as painters, often when we're looking for light, it is, it's a real trap to fall into using white. And we'll talk about color tomorrow, but that light will then dilute your color intensity and it won't necessarily pop in the same way whereas if you put the darker around it that's focusing on your darks and getting those right is what can make a big difference so i know a lot of you use your smartphone and um, we're talking about uh, yesterday in the group talking about how that uh, makes composition easier for you and um, we can also use our smartphone to just make a black and white mono of the scene you're looking at. And that is so instructive. Now, if you have a look at Robin Eli, R-O-B-I-N, Eli, E-L-E-Y, if you look up his Instagram on the 17th of April, he shows you he's making a, um, mono so in, it's not black and white it's brown and white is used i think raw umber or burnt umber as the back as the brown and just white just that mono one color and he's explaining that even someone like him and i've worked with robin he just he gives a demonstration for five hours without stopping like i put a glass of water next to him and yeah yeah he'll say and just keep going he paints 11 hours a day. He is known as the human photocopier. He is a world-renowned realist artist in portraiture. Now, he does an underpainting. So don't think that uh, you're beyond doing underpaintings or the value of the underpainting because it makes everything so much easier to get the light right, that value or tonal value between the darkest and the lightest to get that right. So I use an underpainting, that's part of my process, because remember I was talking about the brain and we want to make things easier. I use a process so then I haven't used up all my thinking time from the prefrontal cortex when I get to something that's difficult. I want a process to make things automatic. And part of mine is actually doing the underpainting just in either black and white or brown and white. So this using just the grayscale and understanding that grayscale. And you see this one, I've, I've laminated it and I put little holes. I've got a dirtier one over here. So I put the little holes and that means I can just put the paint in there to see if I'm if it's really that dark, if I've made it dark enough. Because what happens when we paint is we beam in on one area, right? And then we make that balance. But you can then step back and think, oh, <laughs> I've, now, I've made that one too dark. So then I have to actually repaint everything. So getting that light right while we make the underpainting, it requires us to come up close and step back and use little tools like this to get our eye right so that we can test it, so that we can hold it up and see, yeah, okay, I wanted that to be the darkest value and, and it works there. And here I've gone lighter in the shadow right up to the central line, which is very light. So, you know, it can be the simplest little thing, but getting things right first, in a sense, it's a bit like this course where I'm asking you to think before about what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve before you begin, because I know that will make it so much faster for you and it will make it more enjoyable and things will flow 
when you start actually lining things up to get them to make sense for you. And that's really such a personal thing for you. But that is, that's why I use a process. It's why I use simple little tools like this because I want to enjoy the painting more and, and, um, and have an automatic kind of process that I'm following. Because once you've done the dark to light, you've made the decisions to create the shapes, you've done that once. So, well, you did it the first time when you drew the line. And then the second time, if you just make a, uh, a mono underpainting, and then by the time you come to colour, you really have, you're really familiar with this painting. You know what's going on. You know how that shape is created. So it really helps you build step by step into what you're actually creating. Now, the next point about light is direction. So remember I mentioned Robin. He used to, uh, when he was photographing his portrait subjects, he actually made a, a little room all with black plastic and stuff around it so that no light could get into it at all, so that it was quite black. And then he put the light of the colour and direction that he wanted to hit the subject so that all the light is coming from one direction. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Remember when we talked about uh, the brain of the viewer the brain of the viewer wants everything to be, we want it to be easy for them. We want our painting to make sense for them. And you've given some thought to, are you trying to get them to see something differently? Are you taking them on a journey? Uh, are you wanting them to experience a, a certain emotion, curiosity, or in Callie's case, uh, containment? So how you make the composition and then you choose the light will affect that. So, because when we make something from uh, 2D into 3D, we wanna use all the tools we can to help it make sense. And the direction of the light is one of the things that helps it make sense. So Robin's controlled it, one, from that point of view to help the viewer. Two, as the painter, it makes your life much easier because when light comes from one direction, it will be hitting at certain logical spots and it will be hitting them with one color variation. But I've got natural light coming from outside that way and I've got a light set up that way and I'm trying to balance them out. But if I, and I think I showed you a, a photo of Waverly Stanley, I, I sat Waverly in a window as I sit all my portraiture subjects. I sit them in a window to get the window to act as a light box because it's stopping the light coming from another direction and the main source of light is streaming in just as if you made a little light box set up at home to restrict where the light comes from. But that's why people are making the restriction of light because it makes the painting easier to read and the painting easier to create for the painter because we've got one direction and we've got one color happening because if you do very fine work in in portraiture a change in color you know i i'll use um alizarin crimson and get that purpley look <laughs> in these bits around the eye but i'd use up here on the cheek, then I'd use, you know, a, a bright red, like a cad red or a vermilion. So um, what is going to happen in the light, it's going to affect the colors that we end up using as well. So light is going to give us contrast. And that's what makes a painting interesting. Light helps us read what's happening. And our understanding of using little tools like the grayscale with light will help us problem solve because what you really want to do is get the darkest darks and the lightest lights without affecting your color too much. You don't want to wash out color. So we'll take that thought on to tomorrow when we talk about color. And the third thing was direction. 
so the direction of the light can make it much easier for you when you control it. Now, I take photos outside of plants because I'm so often painting plants if I'm not doing the portraits. And I know a portrait photographer would say this kind of gray day that we've got today is great for, the, for them because of, of the dissipated light. But actually for me with the flowers, as you could see with that tea tree, I like the contrast. I like to um, look at the light coming from behind. So as well as in front and see what makes it more interesting. So yesterday I said, do you have a look at your favorite paintings and see, do your favorite paintings have um, composition basics that you could read like foreground, middle ground, background, what's going on, what attracts your eye? And today I'd ask you as regards light, can you see where the light is coming from in the painting? Is there something about that light? Do you like the light in the morning or the evening? What about the light is uh, helping you or making you more interested and grabbing your attention within a painting? Because these things will all feed on each other and help you to create greater impact when you're looking for impact. When we get to the point where we're talking about uh, making decisions that will bring your paintings to life, it's coming back here to really just the darkest dark and the lightest lights, that value or tone. And the last point I'll make is that I was just saying at the very beginning of the uh, session, I referred to Kelly to... Um, uh, an exhibition that's on but I I found this painting this morning yeah that's it that my Nana did and I'm going to say that this is a tonal kind of value so apart from the horizon line in this painting we've got a journey we've got something going on and uh, we want to see what's what's happening there and Nana used to tell us this stories of this person walking along the path and the lady over here waiting for loved ones to get home in the little house. So she'd tell us a story uh, and she's trying to tell a story through her painting. But I want to show you this one because of the value, apart from that dark in the tree and dark in the horizon line, otherwise the value's all pretty much the same. You know, so it sits in a same zone. Now, when you start looking at the paintings you like, some people uh, create paintings, let's get back to my little grayscale, that don't actually use the whole grayscale. So apart from the dark in the trees, that painting that I just showed you is within this grayscale here. It, it, that darker one at the top would be as dark as it got and then the light is not very light. Now, that can have an effect on you emotionally, all right? So how you use light will affect the viewer and what they're trying to create. And the exhibition that's on at the moment that I have made a little video about that's there on... Um, on my Facebook and my Instagram and the YouTube was about Clarice Beckett, who was a woman here in Melbourne who lived at by Morris. Her family did not like her painting. Her mum was sick. She's the single daughter. She has to stay home. And but she's, she's just the most committed painter you've ever seen. She did have solo exhibitions, uh, but she would get up at four in the morning and take a little trolley of her paints and walk along the by Morris Cliff Line, and I'm going to refer to, well, I've opened at this this one of the flower that does have darks. Otherwise, she's, she's known as a tonalist. Okay, so there's the bridge in the city. It's Swanson Street, right by the gallery. Can you see that we're just talking middle tones? And there was uh, Max Meldrum set up a school 
here that was not the official school, so the politics of it went insane. And she was involved with that group of tonalists that just used those muted central tones on that scale to create what they were doing. And they're very soothing, beautiful paintings. So light in this sense has been used to affect the emotion. So we're talking about yesterday, your composition, and this is light affecting the emotion of the painting. Over here, we've just got people on the beach. So I, I look up the video that I made and then it will make more sense. And you can Google Clarice Beckett, C-L-A-R-I-C-E Beckett. And uh, it's, it's always interesting to see what other people are doing and how they create things. But again, I encourage you to pick something and drill down and get into that. But remember, light can make your, it so much easier for you to create your work and the use of the contrast of light is really what can start to bring the impact that you want. Here's the soft, soft impact for certain emotional messages or you can have the harsh in your face one with the high contrast of really dark, really light next to each other. So, any questions? I'll, I'll hang on a sec because there's a delay in your questions when you ask them. <laughs> I put my glasses on and check. Thank you so much for coming. I really look forward to your comments. And tomorrow we will take it all up a step by adding in color to really uh, bring your paintings to life. But I hope you can see that if we hadn't really got the composition right and we hadn't got the light right, it really won't matter what you do with the color and the details because they still are not going to really sing the way you want them to if you haven't got the underlying darkest darks right or the lightest lights right. Thank you. Thanks for being here.